NBA teams have hired plenty of bad coaches. NBA teams have hired plenty of bad executives. But no team has filled both those jobs quite as disastrously as the Boston Celtics did when they hired Rick Pitino. A single decision that led to years of wasted opportunity, wasted talent, wasted money, and a lot more yelling than winning. This is the worst NBA coaching hire. May 6th, 1997. Bowstone, Massachusetts. Rick Pitino is introduced to fans and media as the next head coach and president of the Boston Celtics after receiving a record-setting 10-year, $70 million contract. Going all out for Pitino was a bold choice considering the alternatives. The Celtics won just 15 games in 96-97 and coach ML Carr stepped down at season's end. Boston had two lottery picks in the upcoming draft and needed someone to lead this rebuilding team. They had options. Just to name a few, Larry Brown was a free agent after leaving the Pacers, but he ended up with the Sixers for a while. Title-winning icon Chuck Daly was considering coming out of retirement, but he wound up doing so for the Magic. Or this guy. Larry Bird is a Celtics legend, had been acting as special assistant in Boston for years, and wanted to become a head coach, which he did. Bird won Coach of the Year in his very first season with the Pacers. The Celtics preferred Patino. Preferred him so much, in fact, that they were willing to demote another Celtics legend, Red Auerbach himself, to secure Patino's secondary role as team president. Patino did what he does best in this press conference. It's what he was doing the last time he visited this arena for an Amway salesman conference. Smooth talk. Buttering up a crowd by saying just the right thing. Patino was and is elite at that. Uncomfortable? No. I'm uncomfortable uh, and humbled sitting below these banners. Um, but I'm very excited to contribute to the raising of another one. But it's not like Patino was unqualified for the job. In the 80s, Patino jumped from a Final Four team at Providence to the NBA, where he helped turn around the Knicks. Then he jumped right back to college, highlighting an eight-year stint at Kentucky with an NCAA championship in 1996. His star on that team was the first young star he'd coach in Boston, Antoine Walker. But before he could coach, Patino would have to do some managing, because that was his job too. He traded for a GM, Chris Wallace, and the two of them started planning for the NBA draft where they had those two lottery picks. Unfortunately, the lottery was not as kind to Boston as Patino hoped. Or hope might not even be the right word. Flash forward to the year 2000 and you'll find Patino saying, the thing that attracted him here was the thought that they were gonna get Tim Duncan. That was an outcome with about a 38% chance of happening. But to quote Patino, if that failed, it was almost 50% we were gonna get the number two pick in Keith Van Horn. They didn't. The lottery machine spat out picks number three and six for Boston. Patino's first thought was to ditch the picks in a trade for Scottie Pippen, but the Bulls ultimately said no. Draft night arrived and Duncan, the clear number one choice and one of the greatest players ever, would go to another coach slash executive, Greg Popovich and the Spurs. The coveted Van Horn went number two, as expected, and Van Horn actually got traded, but not before Patino tried to interfere by filing a protest with the league. But Patino's Celtics were still in great shape. They could have done way better than Keith Van Horn if they'd capitalized. With the third pick, Boston snagged Colorado's Chauncey Billups. We'll come back to him. The sixth pick? Patino made a big show of desiring high school phenom Tracy McGrady, but it was all a smokescreen for Patino's real target, Ron Mercer, his own Kentucky shooting guard who wasn't very good at, you know, shooting. McGrady went ninth to the Raptors and later became a superstar. Anyway, besides the draft, Patino the president had a lot of team to build for Patino the coach. In July, Patino signed mediocre tall man Travis Knight to a seven-year, $22 million deal. Knight neither expected nor really wanted to become a Celtic, but couldn't resist such a long contract. To make room for signings like Knight and fellow mediocre tallman Andrew DeClerc, Patino renounced rights to all nine of Boston's free agents, including Rick Fox, who'd become a starter on multiple Lakers championship teams. Knight would also win a championship with the Lakers after Patino traded him a year and a half into that contract for mediocre tallman Tony Batie, who they signed to an even pricier contract. Making moves then undoing them became a signature of Patino's presidency. In August of 97, the Celtics signed Chris Mills to a $34 million contract. Then they traded Mills to the Knicks before he'd even played a game in green. Around the same time, Patino dealt Eric Williams to the Nuggets. Williams would tear his ACL days after his Nuggets debut, and then Patino's Celtics would reacquire him two years later for a package that included 1997 draft pick Ron Mercer. 
The man loved to make deals. Just ask Antoine Walker, who watched the roster around him flip several times over. Patino had a complex relationship with Walker, his former Kentucky star. It went relatively okay, give or take Walker skipping voluntary summer workouts. One of several times Patino openly criticized his temperamental star. He considered trading Walker a few times too. But Patino spoke proudly and honestly kind of condescendingly about how he related to Walker. On that note, let's see how Patino coached his prized third pick, Chauncey Billups. The very first game of Patino's Celtics tenure was a rousing victory over the defending champion Bulls. Walker led the team in scoring, and Billups played terrifically in his debut off the bench. After that, disaster. Billups was meant to be Boston's point guard of the future, an important player to develop. Patino handled that by screaming at Billups so much that he was constantly looking over his shoulder on the court and complaining about Billups in the media. Then, 51 games into Billups' career, Patino traded him away for the decline in Kenny Anderson. Billups would one day develop into a regular all-star, a finals MVP, and probably a Hall of Famer. But as a rookie Celtic, Patino deemed him not my kind of point guard. The creepily paternal, college-style approach showed up everywhere in Patino's coaching. He insisted on playing a full-court, pressing defense, the kind of thing that works with kids but drains NBA players over an 82-game season. To quote Bill Simmons, Patino was slowly sucking the life from his players. And just like in college, Patino expected to be a star himself. D. Brown, one of the many players Patino dumped from Boston's roster, described him as a me person. The 98 Celtics won just 36 games, so that summer, Patino the president got back to work. Boston did great in that draft, when Paul Pierce fell into their lap with the 10th pick. Pierce had an excellent rookie year. The Celtics got worse. And they didn't get to make a first round selection in the 99 draft because Patino traded the pick for mediocre largeman Vitaly Potapenko. Cleveland ended up using that pick they got on future league assist leader Andre Miller while Boston still had the aging Anderson at point guard. And the next season, Boston still failed to match the 36 wins they'd gotten in Patino's first year. In March of 2000, the Raptors beat the Celtics on a Vince Carter buzzer beater that was assisted, by the way, by McGrady, a guy Patino passed on for Ron Mercer. Anyway, the smooth-talking Patino didn't sound so smooth after the loss, and this diatribe would go down in history. Larry Bird's not walking through that door, fans. Kevin McHale's not walking through that door, and Robert Parrish is not walking through that door. And if you expect them to walk through the door, they're going to be gray and old. I wish we had 90 million under the salary cap. Wish we could buy the world. We can't. The only way we can do is work hard. Keep in mind that all but a couple players on Patino the coach's roster were put there by Patino, the president. But by the following season, Patino was openly talking about leaving and admitting that this job has turned out to be tougher than I thought. In January of 2001, with a season record of 12 and 22, Patino quit, forfeiting a massive amount of money to return to the life he knew best. College, a world where coaches are stars, players are used to getting screamed at, press and trap defense works, and instead of managing a salary cap, you can just do scandals. By the way, Patino's assistant coach, Jim O'Brien, took over as an interim and went 500 the rest of that season. Then the very next year, he took Boston to the Eastern Conference Finals. And of course, Pierce later won a ring as part of a well-constructed and well-coached Celtics team. These days, it's clear that transitioning straight from college coaching to the pros is difficult. There are success stories, but many more failures. It's equally apparent that being a coach and executive is a lot to ask of one person. Again, there are exceptions, but it goes wrong more than it doesn't. But in 1997, the Celtics attempted all of the above all at once. They hired a college guy to be their coach and president, ignoring way better options, including one right in their lap. Doing so set the franchise back years. They blew opportunities to develop quality guards, blew millions of dollars on mediocre tall men, and tested the patience of multiple stars. The Celtics tried to kill two birds with one stone, but it was a very crappy stone and they only killed themselves.